The financial loss from weather-related events is at an all-time high. With fires, floods, hurricanes, and rising sea levels, will climate change be the cause of our next financial crisis? Today, we learn more about the cost of climate change. Thanks for listening and subscribing to Learning More, where each episode we bring you a new story about people, inventions, pop culture, and life. Today, we are joined by Garth Hutel, an associate professor of economics at Georgia State University, and we are talking about the cost of climate change. Uh, climate change, you know, we, we see the cost of it on our planet or hear about the cost of it, but there's definitely a big financial risk here as well. So Garth, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. All right. So since 2000, we, we've lived through terrorism attacks, uh, a mortgage lending crisis, uh, and of course, the, the pandemic. <laughs> They've all led to big financial issues. Uh, this, of course, makes me wonder what's next, right? Do you feel that climate change could be the next big financial crisis? It's definitely a risk, uh, a possibility, and it's definitely something that financial regulators and central banks are talking about and planning for. So it's definitely something that we should be thinking about. Um, climate change is something that we've been thinking about for a long time, and we've looked at lots of different costs of climate change or lots of different ways that climate change could damage uh, the environment and, and damage the economy, things like the health effects of higher temperatures and the effects on agriculture and, and productivity and other sectors. But now or recently, there's this uh, worry that climate uh, and climate policy could create these financial instabilities in the in instabilities in the financial sector, essentially because you have a lot of banks uh, that are exposed to a lot of sort of climate uh, sensitive um, assets or assets that might be devalued after climate policy comes along. So if banks are heavily invested in fossil fuel sectors and uh, you have this reduction in the value of fossil fuel sectors, either because of climate change or because of climate policy, then that could sort of spur this uh, contagion uh, effect where uh, the banking sector could, could tighten up like it did during the Great Recession and we could have a recession again uh, sort of triggered by that. So there's worries, that kind of worry leads to, uh, you know, people thinking about what are the ways that we can kind of address this issue, both addressing climate change, because climate change itself is a problem, uh, but addressing climate change in such a way that we don't have to worry about these kind of financial contagion effects that could happen from regulating climate change. Okay, so let's talk about banking. They have uh, required minimal capital requirements, right? Where uh, basically that could sustain these banks. But if they're going to see big issues potentially with climate change, will those minimal capital requirements be enough to sustain the banks? Well, one of the worries, uh, so we don't know. Um, and so there's a lot of risk there. And, and one of the, uh, speaking of capital requirements, one of the policy recommendations or policies that are, is being discussed is to adjust those capital requirements essentially to reflect these climate risks mm -hmm. that you're thinking about, that people are thinking about. So like, for example, you could imagine uh, minimum capital requirements that sort of uh, are weighted or vary according to how much capital you have in, in kind of climate sensitive industries or climate sensitive firms versus uh, less sensitive firms. Like, for example, green capital versus brown capital. So investing in um, like renewable resource generation versus investing in fossil fuels or holding assets in fossil fuel sectors. So these um, these capital requirements could be sort of weighted or in some, there could be some sort of formula that recognizes the fact that there's these risks that you described that could specifically uh, uh, affect the brown sector, the polluting sector, um, risks both from climate change and from climate policy. And so if these capital requirements could be um, designed to reflect that and essentially penalize banks, more or less penalize banks for holding on to brown assets and, and reward banks for holding on to green assets, then that could be sort of a way to ease the transition uh, in response to climate or to cli climate policy. Okay, so a lot of that depends on the government going in and creating regulations, which means also the government needs money. I read a report recently about military 
bases within the United States. Many of these could be underwater at least three months out of the year within the next 15 years or so. Military bases are expensive. They've got a lot of expensive equipment. How will the U.S. government recover from the cost of climate change? Yeah, that's right. Climate's definitely going to affect a lot of different areas. You've got sea level rise that's putting not just, you know, military installations, but a lot of residential housing and businesses potentially underwater, literally. So, so that's a big risk. So with these risks, and there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that, and we don't know how big of an effect this is going to be. We don't know how much sea level is going to rise, how fast it's going to rise. Um, uh, so a lot of these, you know, arguments are like worst case scenarios, like maybe what you're describing and what some people are describing. And the fact that these are worst case scenarios might lead some, you know, climate skeptics or, or people who are hesitant to sort of support aggressive climate action to say, oh, you know, that's this sort of worst case scenario, chicken little kind of thing. It's not really something to be taken seriously. But of course, the point of like insurance and the point of, you know, guarding against these extreme risks is that, yeah, of even if they are well, unlikely to happen, like if they did happen, it'd be really terrible. So like, that's why we sort of insure uh, against these things, both like personally, that's, you know, why like I have life insurance um, and also like as a society, why we uh, take care of these things that have like high, low probability events, but sort of high costs if they happen. And climate change seems to fall into that category. And so sort of the financial regulation or, or the, the, the aspect of climate change where it could sort of trigger this financial contagion is just kind of one aspect of uh, this whole set of risks and uncertainties associated with climate change that, that a lot of central bankers think that they could sort of specifically target because, you know, uh, the financial regulators and central bankers are sort of in charge of that whole system. So they want to make sure that system is resilient to climate change. And then there's these other systems like the military or like the residential, the housing sector, if all these different sectors are um susceptible to the damages from climate change, then there's a whole slew of different ways that they can uh, respond and they can try to insure themselves against these risks. You bring up insurance. It's, it's almost like we're leaning more on the cleanup and the rebuild than we are on figuring out ways to prevent them from happening. So I guess that leads to the question of <laughs> on a financial basis, are we just too late to recover from this? Well, I hope not. I, you know, you, you get uh, the scientists, a lot of scientists, you know, saying how close we are to sort of tipping points. Like if we don't act soon, we're going to be, you know, the temperatures are going to rise really fast. And there's these specific types of climate tipping points that could happen that when they happen, uh, they're, you know, they, they could be irreversible, like melting of these large ice sheets or uh, thawing of permafrost or reversals of, of, of the jet stream. Um, that could have these kind of permanent irreversible effects on the climate. Again, those are kind of worst case scenario mm -hmm. things, but like they're, they might have low probabilities of happening, but if they happen, that would be very, very bad. So they're things that we should really think about um, addressing. Uh, but right, we haven't sort of globally, you know, there have been a lot of discussion about climate policy globally and, you know, domestically, locally, et cetera. There've been a lot of discussion of climate policy. And of course the Paris agreement was this big kind of breakthrough in international negotiation. But it seems that sort of almost everyone agrees that like what's been done is, is way, way smaller in terms of reducing emissions and mm -hmm. adaptation or responding to threats. What's been done is like way, way smaller than what what most anyone thinks needs to be done to kind of address this issue. So um, so my people, the economists, you know, we for a really long time have been hammering on this message of uh, putting a price on carbon. Um, you know, because uh, if you make the idea being that people are emitting carbon dioxide, which contributes to climate change and it's damaging the environment. And if you make people sort of pay for the damage that their carbon dioxide emissions are causing through, say, a tax on carbon or a fee, if you want to call it a fee on carbon, or by setting up, say, like a cap and trade system like they have in the European Union mm -hmm. and in California and some other areas, a cap and trade system for carbon dioxide where uh, there you set up a market for carbon permits, but then effectively emitters have to pay a price on carbon. Uh, if you get this price on carbon, then people are going to sort of internalize those damages that their their activities are causing to the to the environment, and then we'll sort of get to a better outcome. So that's what economists love. Economists, we economists love to tell that story and argue that we should have this price on carbon. Um, and that's that's all great. I think we should have a price on carbon. The issue, though, is that sort of the, the places where we do have prices on carbon, the price seems to be pretty low. Uh, I mean, relative to what a lot of economists and other scientists think should be the price or, or relative to what we would need to get substantial reductions in carbon emissions that could 
help uh, slow uh, climate change. Mm-hmm. Once you start setting a high cost for something, it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe there is a better way to do this. <laughs> okay, so we've been talking about this from sort of like a global perspective or big business, uh, the, you know, the big banks, the military, the big business. Let's talk about small business. Let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about personal finance and maybe perhaps some of the opportunities. And we'll do that uh, when we come back. We'll take a short break and we'll have more on Learning More. If you enjoy history, maybe you're just feeling a little nostalgic or you wonder who's having a birthday today, or maybe you need a reason to celebrate. Well, we've got the perfect podcast for you. It is called This Is Today. And each and every day we talk about the historic events, celebrity birthdays. We also talk about whatever is going on today. There's always something to celebrate when you listen to This Is Today. And at just 10 minutes each day, you can make it a daily habit. You can even add it to your Alexa Flash briefing. Click the link in the description or just search in your favorite podcast app for This Is Today. Thanks for listening and thanks for subscribing to Learning More. This week, we're talking about the financial impact of climate change. We've talked kind of on a global scale to this point. And now let's turn it to our personal finances and let's start with jobs. I've heard both sides of this argument, or at least people have made both sides of this argument rather. Uh, Climate change could create jobs. Climate change could kill jobs. Garth, what impact will climate change have on jobs? Yeah. So of course there's a big debate, both about the effect of climate change and the effect about the effect of climate regulation or climate policy on jobs and, and, and people who generally don't support climate policy will say that, you know, these regulations are going to kill jobs. Um, they're going to coal miners are going to lose their jobs, et cetera. Um, and then people who generally favor doing something about climate will say, no, these reg- regulations are going to create jobs because there's going to be all these people building windmills and solar panels and what have you. So the question is, what's true? So it's hard to answer that question. There's been a lot of studies um, from economists and others who kind of look to see what's the net effect going to be or where are jobs going to move. So I've got uh, several studies that are looking at the effect of um, not of climate change itself, but of climate policy on labor markets and unemployment. How could climate affect unemployment? So in one study, we have this uh, uh, computational model of the U.S. economy, and we sort of simulate all these different types of climate policies, carbon taxes, and other types of policies and see where the jobs go and and the impact on overall employment. And so what we see, which is pretty similar to what a lot of other studies are seeing, is that like the overall effect of climate policy on the unemployment rate is not very high. Maybe there's a a small, like a few decimal points of a percentage point increase in the aggregate unemployment rate, but not these kind of massive job losses that some people are predicting from the climate policy. Um, but what we do see in our paper is that it is, is that in certain sectors of the economy, of course, they, that are very susceptible or that are very uh, targeted by climate policy, like fossil fuel sectors, you can have high unemployment rates. And the question then is how those workers who, whose jobs maybe have disappeared, say in the coal sector, how easy is it for those workers to move from the coal sector to another sector, say the renewable electricity sector, or just any other sector, like the service sector, or any other sector that might expand um, when the coal sector contracts. So of course the question is that how is it, how easy is it for coal miners to find jobs in other sectors or for labor to be mobile in general. And that's a hard question. We don't really know how easy that is. Um, but what we show in our paper is that that's really crucial to understand like how, um, even though it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not crucial for understanding the aggregate, the effect on aggregate unemployment, which is going to be small, but the effects on unemployment in individual sectors is going to vary highly depending on how mobile these workers are. So that's something that's definitely uh, needed. Uh, we have to have a better understanding of how mobile those those workers are you know i i think another segment um okay travel and and tourism you know i mean that was hit hard after 9 11 and then again because of the pandemic you know with the sea level rise and other weather caused issues it could really hit the tourism industry very hard And and okay yeah we could talk about the big airlines or the cruise lines but really at the heart of travel is the small companies you know the, the mom and pops and these random places that, that really support or are supported by the, the travel and, and tourism market. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. You think that there's definitely a lot of industries that are um, susceptible to climate damages and the employees in those industries are going to be very susceptible. And in fact, that's a good point. What I was just talking about a, a minute ago was all about the effects on the labor market from climate policy and how they might not be as bad. They're probably not as bad as some people think they are. But of course, there's also the effects uh, uh, on labor markets of climate change itself. Mm -hmm. So for example, if um, uh, you know, sea level rise is causing you know the tourism industry to be upturned, and that could affect jobs in the tourism sector, for example. Um, and so the idea is costs to so so when you look at the effects of climate policy on jobs, you should we didn't in our paper, and a lot of people haven't yet. But what you should also consider is the benefits of reducing climate change. So like maybe it's true that there's some job loss in uh, fossil fuel sectors, and maybe not all those jobs will be found in other sectors, but you're avoiding job loss in tourism sector or these other sectors, or say agriculture, other sectors that are very susceptible to the damages from mm -hmm. climate change. Um, so those are all things that we that we have to consider. But those are, like you said, those are things that affect individuals right. uh, that we have to think about. Okay, let's, let's flip it over to the personal finance. Uh, what, are there actual like opportunities out there? What should we be doing for our personal finances uh, to sort of prep for the potential for a, a crisis caused by climate change. Uh, going back to our research study on the financial sector, there's this sort of risk of financial contagion um, and there being a recession. And as an individual, say, investor in an individual household uh, person, it's sort of hard to you know, avoid that. If the economy goes into recession, it's difficult to, mm -hmm. to avoid being damaged uh, by that in some way. Um, yeah, so that's a tricky question. It's, it's, I'm not sure that there's an asset that you, know, you could buy or some, some kind of... Uh, investment portfolio or some way you could live your life and you could avoid altogether the financial consequences of climate change or any consequences of climate change. It's this kind of thing that's going to hit us all. Okay. So it's going to hit us all. It's might hit us in our pocketbook, but it also, you know, when you look at the skies, uh, you've got smoke, you've got carcinogens in the air, you've got uh, the sea level rise, you've got a lack of water. There's a huge potential cost for healthcare and for the health of everyone, is healthcare just going to be just the biggest cost in all of this? Yeah, well, when you traditionally, you know, when when people have looked at sort of the the costs uh, to the economy of uh, sort of like traditional air pollution, so not not climate change, not greenhouse gases, but but things like carbon monoxide and particulate matter mm -hmm. smog, things that that cause the haze haze and that you know make you cough. And, Air smells bad. So you look at those uh, the damages uh, to the economy from traditional air pollution. It's overwhelmingly from the health consequences, and in particular from mortality consequences, because it does. There's a huge uh, literature documenting that these traditional air pollutants, especially particulate matter, have these uh, uh, affect people's mortality. They kill people. Um, so, and, and then you, you, if you want to try to sort of quantify the the damages from uh, increased risk of mortality, that's a uh, sort of controversial topic to tackle, but economists try to do it. Then you see that these, uh, even with very kind of conservative um, valuations of those mortality damages, those damages kind of outweigh anything else. So the sort of the health damages, in particular, the mortality cost of traditional air pollution are very high. So now when you're looking at climate change, um, carbon dioxide, we, we think, doesn't sort of directly make you sick by breathing it in the same way particulate matter does. But there's two things. Uh, first, the you know by burning fossil fuels, you emit carbon dioxide and you emit all these other pollutants. Mm -hmm. So by reducing carbon dioxide emissions, we're also reducing all these other pollutants. There. So we get we say we get co-benefits from carbon dioxide reductions in the fact that we're reducing uh, these pollutants that directly cause health effects. But on top of that, by uh, reducing the damages of climate change, in particular the increased temperatures, you can uh, avoid. Uh, mortality and other health costs from the temperature increases. So there's a growing literature that's showing that, you know, increase in hot days can have health effects and, and in fact, can have mortality effects on people, especially um, people who are uh, sensitive or poor health, especially the elderly and children. Um, so there are a lot of studies that are, that are sort of predicting how much climate change not the air pollution part, but just the increased temperatures, how much that might affect uh, human mortality going forward, given the predictions that we have for um, the temperature increases that we're expected to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as an economist, if you were in charge of everything, <laughs> what would you do to 
help to deal with the issue of climate change and finance? Sure. Well, as an economist, I am obligated to say, I'm contractually obligated to say that we should put a price on carbon, um, which, which now not just economists, but I think most policymakers think is sort of a necessary, a necessary uh, tool. Uh, we should put a price that's probably going to be increasing over time to reflect the fact that technology is growing and will get cheaper, easier and easier to reduce carbon emissions. Okay. Um, that's aggressive to get substantial reductions, you know, to meet our Paris goals and probably exceed our Paris goals. But I think I'd go farther than that and say, in addition to this uh, price on carbon, uh, we want a, a slew of other policies, in particular, these regulations in the financial sector, regulations coming from uh, central banks to minimize the, the risk of this financial contagion. And in particular, sort of the kind of more traditional policies to reduce emissions, things like subsidizing electrical vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure and research and development, um, uh, minimum um, renewable, por renewable portfolio standards for minimum amount of energy or electricity that's generated from renewables and all sorts of policies like that that would complement uh, the price on carbon. And we should do that pretty soon, like now. We should do it aggressively. We should also focus on the, the burden and the distributional effects of the climate change. We didn't talk about that too much, but you know, the damages from climate are overwhelmingly gonna, gonna affect the poorest people mm -hmm. uh, in the world. Um, so we should be cognizant of that. And there's also a risk that Climate policy could be regressive, things like uh, increasing the price of gasoline and electricity. But there are certainly ways to design these systems so that you can avoid the regressivity um, and make sure that the burden isn't disproportionately uh, faced by the, the most vulnerable in society. So, for example, if you do have a price on carbon, then you could return those carbon revenues in a way that offsets the regressivity mm -hmm. of the of the carbon price, if there is any regressivity of the carbon price. So let's say those that happened, you know, magic wand, all of those things happened. How long before we actually see things improve? Yeah, that's tricky because the, the well, there, there's a lot of things that are slow in this equation. The climate itself is very slow. Mm -hmm. So like the carbon dioxide that we emit is going to be up there for many, many years. Like when my grandkids are hanging out, they'll be breathing in some of that carbon dioxide probably. So that's slow. Um, and the climate system in general is slow, how temperature responds. We've already got all this carbon up in the air that's going to be warming us for quite a bit. And then, you know, the economy changes slow. So even if we magic wanded a carbon price and these regulations today, it would still take a while uh, for carbon emissions to come down substantially because, you know, people right. are still going to be driving their cars mm -hmm. and power plants are still going to be churning out things for at least, you know, five kind of five, 10 year uh, time scale. But obviously starting it now is what's crucial because by starting it now, we can avoid the, the worst damages. Uh, for our children and grandchildren. Okay, so we're ending the conversation on finance here, but the conversation continues. Next time, we are gonna to talk to an environmental toxicologist about the smoke in the air and how it impacts our health and what we can do about it. Also, I've got an assistant professor of disaster research coming up in the coming weeks as we continue our conversation about climate change. Garth, thank you so much for helping us start the conversation and helping us learn more about climate change and finance. Thanks for having me. Next week, we continue the conversation and the best way to make sure that you don't miss it is to subscribe. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Also, be sure to check out our daily show. This is today. The link is in the description of the podcast. I'm Russ, and I'll talk to you next time.